Monika Junitja. She's professor in global art history at the University of Heidelberg, and her areas of research span the fields of European and Indian studies. Her work is focused, amongst others, on multi-centered modernism and heritage as a transcultural concept. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, Kitty and Wayne and Met Met <laughs> for this um, introduction, uh, invitation. And thank you, Anka, also for your kind introduction. Um, and a big thank you to all of you who made this wonderful exhibition possible. It's one of the most memorable ones I've seen in the recent years. And it's been very inspiring. And, um, and some of the ideas I'll, um, I'll try and bring into this presentation. As Kitty just um, uh, explained in her um, introduction and also in the concept note that um, was sent around to us, um, which asked if we could think of a politics of the imagination. Um, can the imagination be seen as a way of constructing the world? And then it further goes on to say, what are the ways in which artists imagine the world and how the artists imagining the world can help us constructing a possible future? Uh, well, reading this, I felt, on the one hand, this enormous um, burden of utopia which it places on the shoulders of the artist and I have to say it brought to my mind an um, anguished recognition by William Kentridge of the challenge that his art and the world demanded of him and he said how does one bring the entire representation of the world in one's head which is he had in mind the uh, innumerable forces that bore down upon him as he shaped his uh, experience of the connected world and one of his favorite images which I'd like to uh, show you today is, and it's, I think it's a famous one, most of you probably have seen it, is this drawing, um, you know, of this globe staggering unsteadily on these sort of tripod-like legs across this desolate urban landscape. So, in this sense, I will not pretend that I have the answers to all these important but big questions asked here, and certainly um, I cannot rattle them off in 15 minutes. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk about some of the issues that you know I've been mulling over these past years while relating to contemporary art, and hoping maybe we can um, you know uh, talk about these together. And and this is more so after having got to know Maya Line and her work and seeing this sort of stunning museum exhibition yesterday at the Museum of the, La the Lacanal. So let me um, uh, preface my uh, remarks by um, one observation, which is that in any talk of contemporary art, the two words that we uh, words that we immediately associate with it are global and the world, and these are two words, and both of them figure uh, in the title of this symposium. Um, we tend to use them interchangeably, uh, by uh, but it might help if we think about conceptually differentiating one from the other. The globe as both a material artifact and an abstraction, and its expressive power lies really in the ideological representation of this world to which it purports to give a tangible form. It helps, you know, masterfully visualize the earth as a totality, as universal form. And we've seen since early modern times, since its invention, it has been what uh, <coughs> has been called an affective uh, object, uh, <coughs> and it's uh, it's wields this magnetic pull as a kind of an affective symbol too. We've seen this also in the, the, the in Shenzhen's um, in, in, in installation in the museum of which Kitty also talked about. So this is the globe as an abstract universal form. The world, on the other hand, and this is also the uh, this tension which is inherent in uh, the work uh, Shen Zhen has um, offered us. Um, the world as an inhabited space, as real, as marked by 
tangible features, memories, relationships, connections. The world is what the artists and all of us are anchored in. A world could be locality, it could be region, it could be a trans-regional constellation. The world, if you like, is what we carry with us when we traverse the globe. <clears throat> so when we speak of contemporary art as global art, we are actually dealing with a paradox of kinds. Because global, again, we speak of contemporary art global because we look at it through the lens of globalization as a mode and process, you know, something that abolishes spatial and temporal distances, separating regions and cultures. Globalization is also about advanced capitalism. It's about neoliberalism. It's an organizing ideology that seeks to envelop and submerge subjectivities. And art is not a replica of these processes because much of artistic practice is actually about resistance to these forces. Art is not about capitulating to the logic of the market. It's really about creating alternative worlds. It's about reinforcing the anchors of civil society. At the same time, contemporary art partakes of global phenomena such as the digital revolution, uh, the networks of connectivity, and these are phenomena which have inspired artists to cross many barriers, not just geographical and cultural ones, but barriers between art and science, as I saw in your work, Maya Line, to participate in these uh, new geographies of culture which have been enabled by global connectivity. Then globalization and the mediatization of culture also means the complicity of institutions of art and big capital. And this we see especially in the context of competitive relationships between these so-called global cities, you know, who, um, whose status as world-class cities depends on this ability to create a culture industry, the spectacular museum architecture, <clears throat> and to host these mega exhibitions. So, in a sense, artistic production also ends up being dependent on these institutional dynamics. At the same time, uh, it generates, the, the same forces generate a kind of artistic and curatorial creativity that looks for alternative modes, alternative modes and conceptual forms, what Ranjit Hoskote um, called the biennials of resistance. But apart from these proliferation of biennials with different models and uh, what Hoskoti calls biennials of resistance, we also have an increasing number of initiatives from below. The smaller and more autonomous artists association, um, I'm thinking of Koj in India and um, uh, Maya Lane's initiative that we, we, we were talking about yesterday, enough room for space. And I think this is the kind of creativity that comes in opposition to these big uh, <coughs> mega shows, which give visibility and inclusion to artists uh, from all over the world. Unlike you know, the, the whole modernist period, t today visibility is not an issue, but it's the conditions that ensure that visibility, which are the ones to be, uh, to be debated. And I think these smaller initiatives are also about changing those uh, kinds of conditions that, uh, that guarantee inclusion. So, world making in art, against this background, you know, I would say that world making in art is really about navigating these paradoxes, these opposing pulls that I've tried to just briefly summarize. And I want to talk about these paradoxes and opposing pulls through looking at the work of another artist, um, which, uh, which I admire a lot, uh, Jan Fo, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, who is known in the Netherlands, as I learned from Mayolin yesterday, through a case which he lost again in one of these institutional battles. And this work, which um, I want to, to uh, look at, is, is called We the People. Uh, it's a work made of some 200 fragments. We the people is the opening line of the constitution of the, uh, of the US. And taken together, these pieces make a big uh, life-size replica of the Statue of Liberty. So the work is like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. And it's not the artist's intention to erect another uh, statue in, in totality, but to distribute the individual pieces over the world. So the public never gets to see it as an integral whole. The different publics see different pieces 
uh, and uh, in, uh, though they, as I said, they all add up. So you have uh, you have works which show you the the feet uh, or the torch, the folds of a robe, uh, the the part of a hand, uh, the crown. So it is. It demands a kind of exertion on the part of the viewer to situate a particular piece, especially if it was a non-figurative one. And each piece could function as an individual work, as a fragment of a larger entity. The, the artist himself is a young uh, in Vietnamese who was born in war-ridden times. And when he was four, he, his family escaped with 20,000 other South Vietnamese to Denmark, and he now lives there as well as in Berlin. He describes his life as nomadic existence. He's been working on these individual fragments over many years. These are manufactured in China, um, overseen by a Swiss company who then outsourced the production to, <coughs> to China. This is a workshop. So the sale of these individual pieces then allows him to fund the rest of the projects. In one of the interviews, he mentioned Qatar as one of the sponsors. And Qatar wanted, quite characteristically, the entire statue. But he sold only <laughs> one arm. Uh, um, he sold one arm on the insistence that a global icon should be distributed globally. So this is suggested both of the commodification and of the nomadic lives in a global present, globalized present. The pieces are mobile, they're part of this global exhibition circuit, lent out, exhibited in different sites and shows, some acquired by museums and private collectors, the others uh, <coughs> uh, remaining in storage in um, Copenhagen. The project took place following the events of 9-11 and the war in Iraq. And it was <coughs> not without political content. The artist views it as a statement about how the superpowers of the Western world were using the idea of quote unquote freedom to enter another war. And his decision therefore to recreate um, the um, only the art, the statue's thin <laughs> copper skin is really intended all to, uh, to speak for the monument's material malleability and by in, in, in implication, the conceptual fragility of the idea of freedom. Now, if we were to cull these elements from this different story, we can get a glimpse into the politics of the imagination in contemporary times. It's about nom nomadism, it's about these globalized networks of production, it's about identity and fluid identities and artists from Vietnam living and practicing in the West, traveling all over, using his work to stage a critique of this, um, <clears throat> in Chakravarti's sense also, this Janist faced quality of liberty from its inception. Liberty, the idea of freedom, which has inspired many struggles for freedom all over the world. Liberty was also used at particular times. War, wars are fought in the name of freedom and liberty. Liberty was used to justify slavery when it was the basis of economic activities. So today also, and this is the kind of you know, the bridge between the past and the present that many artists are doing, this freedom is part of the rhetoric of neoliberalism. And this is the contradiction that he builds into the work itself. The contradiction between this utopian promise and the, this utopia you know, of um, free me movement that is possible for works of art. And here it's exemplified in these mobile fragments. Uh, and yet it's also caught in this market economy. Uh, the work participates in that economy and its utopian promise is a determinant of its market value. And it was, it's these aspects, these um, contemporary aspects that Peter Osborne, when he writes about contemporary art, he, uh, he actually talks about the fiction of the contemporary. He says contemporary is both idea and fiction. Uh, the etymology of the term contemporary, contemporalis, means, means together in time. So it's interpreted as a shared present, existing or occurring together in time, and therefore it projects a unity on the entire period, you know, the spatial elements which are part of the uh, contemporary. And according to Osborne, this is the f it creates this fiction of a single temporality which the world shares. So it makes the contemporary a you know, utopian idea of 
um, unified world without borders, with shared language, and which you anticipate as an ideal. And according to Osborne, it's, it's important to deconstruct this fiction to talk about different but coeval times of, uni uh, of human existence where there is not always a single common shared position. You have asymmetries of power, you have legacies of histories, I don't need to recount the here, colonialism, also the working of global capitalisms, and at the same time you have this illusion of these unbounded spaces, which however are propelled by certain power relations and hierarchies and create their own inclusions and exclusions. So this is a utopian idea which has its both, its positive and negative aspects, and it also, it's positive because it also as an act of productive imagination, it, um, <coughs> it creates, you know, it becomes uh, <coughs> an enabling. And art today has, as I said, it's become this primary marker of contemporaneity. It sustains this utopia of, uh, of free movement. It, it implies that as these objects, as these works travel across, freely across frontiers, so can human beings. Yet we all know that the minute we want to travel, you, you, have, you encounter bureaucracy, you encounter uh, policed frontiers, border crossings has their own ex inclusions and exclusions. It's something that we've, you know, the, the, the discussion today says it all. Uh, all of us go through these, these new bodily routines that have come from these bureaucratic procedures, going through security checks and body scanners, while art moves you know, <laughs> across these uh, freely transnational spaces, especially the Biennial. And one example, which takes a very nice ironic take on this, is a collective of artists from Pakistan called the Karkhana. And um, you know, they reenact this by, this is a group of artists who are situated in different parts of the world, and they try to recreate the practice of these older Mughal workshops um, of art, where a work is, is, is being um, is created by different artists, okay, Dif different individuals. So each one does one aspect of the work, and then it goes on to the next one. Now these are artists who are situated all over the world, and they use their work to show how, you know, so one artist starts it, it's sent by post, to another, you know, from, from Pakistan maybe to Chicago, and, um, <clears throat> and, and the postage stamp you know, is part of the work and it shows you the, the, the movement, the trajectory of the work. So the work can travel, whereas the art, an artist traveling from Pakistan to Chicago has to undergo, uh, you know, a, a large number of bureaucratic controls uh, of the regime, I call. So to, to, to an ironic take on how it's easier, for, you know, uh, for, for the work to travel than the, the, the individuals involved, the artists who produce it. So in a sense, this is, you know, this is, this, this is how contemporary art has both a promise of new possibilities, artistic creation, which is propelled by you know dealing with these with, with these paradoxes and from very very different kinds of subject positions, uh, and and, uh, <clears throat> and and to actually to 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 grappling with this illusion that's been created by the freely moving global capital, and still we do speak of a global imagination, a global imagination which follows. Fong being able to connect transversally with artists across distances. And today, this is possible without the mediation of a metropolitan center. Um, <clears throat> so the question is then that which comes up, does this rest on a shared belief in the universality of art? It's an open question, and I think we, we, can, we will have plenty of time to talk about it. Just one observation here, you know, what we often talk about as a cosmopolitan imagination. This also involves negotiation on the part of all of us uh, who are involved in, in this field uh, built around art. Um, negotiating scales and times between the local, the regional, and global publics, um, and I saw this in your work in one particular way, which we'll talk about later. I want to just show you another way, you know, another way an artist, um, an Indian artist negotiates, an Indian artist who's globally known today, uh, is an Indian whose slide opened the show. This is Subodh Gupta, you all, okay. Uh, <clears throat> he, you know, who draws on these everyday objects, um, <clears throat> 
from the lives of non-westernized middle class Indians who don't use uh, you know china but they use stainless steel materials in in their lives so you know all so you you see all these stainless steel boxes you know for someone like me it's immediately ties up with the, you know with this association of an orderly domesticity a shining kitchen a comfortable family unit these hot cases or tiffin boxes are another great uh, cultural practice in this mega city of mumbai now my time is running out so i don't <laughs> so i can't talk about this work <laughs> yeah um, so uh, so you know, this transformation of this kitchen utensil in a work which maybe says for someone like me it has all kinds of memories and associations when it travels to the rest of the world uh, and seen by different publics you know what you know what what does it mean what does it stand for how is that, how is this universal list message characterized and and, and support gupta very cleverly entitles this work the silk road okay so it's it's far away from my grandmother's kitchen in 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 india it's it's about mobility connected spaces economies and cultures of geographical distance and so he's defining his word but again his his work through this reference to uh, uh, to a silk road which stands for a very old older form of of cosmopolitanism if you like it refers also the skyline refers to a kind of urban metropolis and he's it's is making his work talk then across times and wakes uh, and sculptures and um, okay the last thing i want to just is here so on the one hand here is an assumption that you have an unbounded definition of a work of art anything a kitchen utensil can become a work of art you know if you cast it in a certain way it can bridge cultural and geographical distance so there is this expanded notion of the work of art uh, which uh, today has also become a kind of a criteria for inclusion in the contemporary art world and yet and this is and this is the note i'm going to stop on we are reminded today suddenly with terrible force when conflicts erupt over art today you know we have uh, <clears throat> there is violence there is censorship uh, on works of art right you know around us i mean i don't have to remind you of charlie ebdo or the danish cartoon controversy or very recently the sense the censorship earlier on chris ophelis um, sorry uh, Uh, the the holy virgin mary this was some years back and very recently in the 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 um uh, the biennale of venice the uh, christoph books uh, transformed this misericordia church into a mosque space which got censored as many of you knew it was so what is this other kind of boundary that is also equally a product of a universally collected artwork do we all share the notion that there's a clear distinction between an aesthetic and a cult object is there a universal understanding of art which uh, uh, which um, um, which we share uh, wh- how can we deal with how can we deal with the kind of violence and the conflicts which uh, which erupt which threaten us around works of art around buildings around uh, <coughs> installations like this one there are very complex geopolitical factors involved over here and yet i think it's it's also a challenge for us to think about a boundary that cuts across through the west through the north atlantic west across the world where um, also there are um, maybe conflicting understandings definitions about artistic creativity and what it means what uh, you know and, and what what are the taxonomies that uh, and we are trying to overcome and which um, and which then um, also through the kinds of exclusions they produce and the ac- uh, the access to different kinds of knowledges make also art and art production something that is um, that is really potentially a tinderbox okay i'm going to stop over here thank you very much <laughs>